few are moving up to fill up the front chairs, I will introduce our <laughs> panel for this afternoon discussing Christianity and bigotry. On my left is Mr. Ron Welch from the South Side Way. What would you call it? In center, to my immediate right, is the Reverend Orpheus Williams from Grace Emanuel Baptist Church, not Lutheran, as you have indicated in the program. We apologize a second time for doing it twice. And to the far right, Reverend Robert Evans, the American Lutheran Church, Prince of Glory Lutheran Church. Both of the latter two men serve churches on the north side, near north side. In the morning session, we began by having short statements by the group, but I think perhaps we'll dispense with that this afternoon and move directly into questions from you. Now, this will be the format. We'll entertain any question that you have related to our topic. I hope you will relate it to the topic somehow. We're interested especially in the church, what the churches have done to encourage racism, bigotry, um, what they can do about it, what the black community thinks of white churches, anything that you would like to hear these men discuss. to ask Reverend Williams if he feels that the history of the black church and its history has in any way uh, helped to decrease the dignity of the black people. Is this, has this fostered this attitude the way sometimes the white church does? Now, I'm just checking. Could all of you hear that question? Probably not. The question is, has the black church helped decrease the sense of dignity of the Negro people? <laughs> decrease it. I would like to say in response to that that the black church really have been all that the black man could leave, lean on to keep and to hold up his dignity. Although the black church have not been what it should be and still is not. But this is what have brought us thus far. Uh, we have always been taught to look up and not around us. Therefore, we have looked up, and by looking up, we could lift our heads and stay as, I would say, Christ fathers. What is the feeling now with respect to the black church? Do they want to remain as black congregation stronger and better or is the desire for integration among the, the uh, Christian members of the church? Is it really, I don't believe in a such thing as a black church, no way. Uh, I would like to refer you that to God's church and God's church could be made up out of many different colors, it's like a flower various beautiful flowers all mixed up one beautiful bouquet of flowers uh i think when you speak of god's church and not a black church i think this is what's really wrong we're speaking in terms of black churches and a white church but we ought to speak in terms of god's church because if we are christ fathers or christian as we're supposed to be then we would say god's church and grace emmanuel i welcome everyone whosoever will let them come and often I'll tell them, this is not my church, this is God's church. I think this is the attitude that all churches should take. I'd like to ask Mr. Welch if he thinks that the church, that organizational church, still has, uh, could be effective in the whole movement, and if so, how, or is it too late? The question is, can the organizational, the institutional church be effective <laughs> in what kind of movement? Well, the whole issue of that whole 
the whole race, uh, race issue. I'll answer that by saying who I am. I was a Catholic priest for five years until last summer. And I quit for the reason, the answer that I'll give to your question. Uh, I think some, uh, somewhere along the line, the organizational church might wake up and realize what it's supposed to do. I would say it's too steep in money, it's too steep in material criteria, it's too steep in buildings to be able to make the significant change that it has to make to meet the needs today. Now, if they're willing to give over what they have in great quantities to the people who have some ideas as to what might be done without always having strings attached, I'd say then we might get back to the very notion of church. When church gets to be such a big business and such an organization as it is today, be it Catholic, be it Episcopalian, be it Lutheran, or anything else, it's no longer church, it's business. And I think when you, in 313, the problem began with Constantine, where you had church and state, where you had power connected with church. I think there's an awful lot of power that can and ought to be connected with the very notion of church, if you understand group dynamics. I think that you have to have church involved with politics, but I think when church becomes an organization that becomes an entity in itself, as it has now, and uses the power that it has to lobby as it has, and doesn't think about the people that are serving, black, white, red, whatever color you want. I think that you've got a church which is not able to serve. And I think that organized Christianity has been colonial, it's been paternalistic, it's been any of the, whatever you want to call it, in terms of treating people, and it has not thought about humanism, it's thought about materialism. And if it gets over the ba basic notion of materialism that it has, these criteria which it has used for its success symbols, such as your school here or anything else, you know, we build schools, we got so many kids and all that sort of thing. That's not religion. If it gets over that, then it can serve. But I said, as I started out, by saying it's so steeped in money, buildings, and quantity that I question whether or not in our day and age, in my generation, in your generation, it's going to be able to make the significant change. Last statement. I believe that, that changes take place in two ways, from inside institutions and outside institutions, the church is an institution that will not change from the inside. The only reason it will change is because it's forced to change from the outside. From this, would it follow then that the most uh, effective means for a person who considered himself a member of the church, i.e. the body of Christ, is to opt out of the institutional church? The question is, then should a person who feels himself a, a follower of Jesus Christ opt out of the organizational church? I can only speak for myself and say that that's what I've decided to do. I can't tell someone else that that's the best thing to do for them. If enough of us put pressure from the outside, hopefully there's somebody inside who the guys at the top will talk to. They don't want to lose face and talk to us. So they got to talk to somebody inside. And so it's like the black man who, who stays in the institution. Because we on the outside, or the way or somebody else pressure, somebody will finally talk to that man inside the institution. They won't, won't talk to us. That's embarrassing. So if there are people inside the institution who understand what's taking place in the world, then I say, fine, stay there. Because we'll fight like hell on the outside. You fight like hell on the inside, but make sure you're ready and willing to put your job on the line when that guy at the top asks you what should be done. Then I'd say, okay, then you can serve a purpose too. But if you're establishment-minded, get the hell out. Bob, what do you think about that? <laughs> well, I decided to stay on the inside and fight it out. I think speaking in, in relationship to the role of the church in a whole area of human relations and racism, you know, there's a lovely phrase that, that says we become agents of reconciliation. Uh, I really don't buy that. Uh, I, I assume that to be in this position, you have some ability and relationship to communicate with both sides. I think as a white, as a Protestant church, we've lost this relationship. I think there, there are perhaps isolated instances where this is not true, but in terms of the image, the black man has the white church. I don't think we we have that that uh, trust relationship. We have a lousy image, and, and I think uh, and, and it perhaps sounds pessimistic, but to me it's realistic that that at this point we we can in no way really uh, serve that role in terms of some kind of reconciling agent between the black and the white church or black and white people. Uh, this gets into the area of racism and and. Uh, this may come up, and, and perhaps we ought to speak to it then. But uh, I think maybe we're paralyzed, but we're not dead. And, uh, 
and, and hopefully the combination of pressure from the inside and from the outside, uh, you know, some exciting things could happen. And I think are. Jesus Christ said, if you want to live, you have to die. Remember? All the way through his gospel, he said, if you want to live, you have to have the guts to die. He wasn't just talking about individuals. He was also talking about institutions. And if the church wants to live, it has to be willing to die for every generation and for every big circumstantial change in history. Sad to say, the churches have not understood good theology. <laughs> well, I can say that I have died one time, though the song said I don't have to die, but I'm going to sleep away. Uh, but really, I, I, I feel uh, kind of like the old saying said it was a country boy, young minister, come to the big city, and it was a big, beautiful church. And he kept visiting that church and he said, I, I sure would like to get in there to preach. So he asked one of the officials that I've been here, said, I've been here five years and I've never been able to get into this church to preach. He said, don't worry, the church been built 20 years and God haven't been able to get in <laughs> <laughs> So uh, remember, if God can't get in the church, uh, there are going to be problems anyway. The big beautiful building with God left out, and God is important. So when we leave God out, we got problems. So I advise you when you go to church, try to take a little part of God in it. I don't know. There are some studies that show that I don't want them. <laughs> there are some studies that show that there is racism in the church. Um, and that not only that there is racism in the church, but that the church as an institution has very much been a part of promoting that racism. And my question, I guess, is, you know, if we can legislate doctrines like we uh, very, um, you know, uh, legal doctrines of the church, why can't we legally doctrinize the uh, 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 priesthood of all believers and include uh, all colors and all, all uh, uh, races and all this sort of thing. I mean, it seems to me that we 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 have all sorts of doctrines, but that doctrine sort of should include this sort of thing, but it doesn't. And why can't we force our our white congregations into believing that doctrine as we, you know, force them into believing all others? Popular choice. I think the doctrine has always been there, just as the Constitution of the United States has always been there, you know, offering justice and equality to all people. The point is we don't practice it. I don't think we need more, need more doctrines or even a, a clarification of the doctrine of man. Uh, I think we simply have to, you know, live out uh, what we supposedly believe on a question of racism in the church. Uh, you know, I don't think you have to do studies uh, on this any more than to do a study to determine if they're, you know, uh, Eskimos living in Alaska. Uh, I think it, it ought to be a basic assumption, and uh, I don't even have to think you have to belabor the point that uh, racism has played a, a, a great part in, in the history of the church in the United States. Uh, the double kinds of baptisms that uh, we had way back then where we had two orders of baptism, one for white, one for, for black people, because when you talk about, you know, in baptism, uh, dying and being born again and, and set free, you know. You really have to be a little careful how you, uh, in those days, explain this to my white people. And uh, I, I think the racism bit is, is done not in a not in a overt, uh, even aware way today, although that's present. But I was at the Nicollet Hotel a couple nights ago. A guy was passing out tracks supposedly in, in, in behalf of, of human relations uh, in the church. And it was, it was poorly done in the first place, but it said, you know, we, we're, we're, we ought to be together. And, and they had a picture on each page, and one was a, a white man giving a blood transfusion to a black man. And, and all the way through, it was a white man, you know, helping this poor black man. And, and really, it was a racist track under the guise of, a, of an attempt to talk about uh, human relations. So it's there. And it's in all of us. Uh, 
I think, deeply ingrained, and uh, I think maybe it's the, the, the thorn in the flesh that we, we have to deal with daily. We're saturated with, with a sense of superiority, and, uh, and this is true in the church, not because it's the church, but we're human beings in the church. And uh, in spite of uh, what we ought to believe, we don't. And uh, I think there are a lot of reasons why. I think the doctrines are, are sufficient now. We just don't, uh, we don't believe them. We don't live them. You used two words that really bother me, legislate force. You, you were talking about legislating doctrine and you were forcing people to believe something. Let those. I mean by tradition, I mean, you know, we aren't a part of the church unless we're baptized. We're not a part of the church. Oh, all right. You want the... That kind of traditional sense of legislation. All right. But I think what you're getting down to is the basic problem that we've come up with in religion, which is when you start theorizing that much on religion and you start figuring out how many angels can dance in the head of a needle and all that sort of thing, you know. Uh, this is when you get into the problem of what religion is or isn't. Religion is a way of life. And there probably are as many religions as there are people, and yet people will come to some agreement and end up with a movement such as Christianity or Muslim or whatever it might be, Islam or whatever it might be. But when you come down to legislating, and when you come down to using that word forcing something, uh, those two words, right off the bat, as I say, bespeak something that I don't want any part of. I'll never be part of an organized religion again. I'll be part of the way. I'll be part of the black people's movement, despite the fact i got a white face. And as far as I'm concerned, that's religion. But I'll never be part of a religion that gets so defined that it does what you said. Do I make any sense? Yeah. yeah. You know, that's, as far as I'm concerned, what got religion into the problem it's in right now. And how does it undefine itself to fit a society which is so complex, which has so many differentiations, so many different circumstances, which is cybernetic, which is technological, go right down the line. It can't fit all those unless it's become so non-defined and yet it has some basic goals about humanism and as Reverend Williams said when you go to church bring God into church you know how do you bring God into church by understanding and believing what you are what another person is that's God we put God way up here we've defined him we've defined God's organization quotation marks and we end up with a church which is all screwed up Yes, I would like to uh, direct this question to uh, Reverend Evans. He mentioned earlier that we would rather stay in and fight. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, what happened to uh, Bishop Pike, Father uh, Malcolm Lloyd, and uh, to a lesser extent uh, to Father Drop, would be any kind of disparagement to the men of law who really speak up against the institutionalized church and their stand. <laughs> the question is directed to those like uh, Pastor Evans who have decided to stay within the structure of the organizational church and fight from there. And the question is, um, isn't it a rather discouraging thing to people like this to view what, is, what has happened to people like Malcolm Boyd, Father Groppy in Milwaukee, and who else is uh, name? Bishop Pike. Bishop Pike. You could also add the name of Jesus Christ to that one, too. And uh, maybe that's where things kind of fit together. I, I don't think we're called to succeed or, or you know, do an easy way of life, but uh, we're called to lay it on a line. And if we can't be honest and if we can't be open, uh, you know, then we don't even have any business in, in the organized church. I mean, that's, I think, the name of the ball game, whether in a church or, or in, a, in a, the human relations game or or whatever it is, if at this point you're not, I mean, this isn't a movement that will, you know, be resolved in the next two or ten or, or fifty years. If you're if you're going to commit yourself to, to even the movement in respect of the of the church, I think you have to be ready to to lay your life on the line. And and if, if it's anything less than that, then I would say, you know, you're really a phony. And. Uh, and these men only remind us of the fact that, you know, this is a game that, that isn't a game, it's for keeps. It's uh, you bet your life and that's it. I, I feel that this question goes deeper though and asks whether, in your opinion, the institutional uh, church is capable of doing anything worthwhile here. 
That is whether whether the uh, suffering and giving of oneself and so on that you just described really will be worth it for those that stay inside the structure. As it, is the church really capable of doing anything here? Well, I think only to the point that it recognizes a power that comes from beyond itself. I think we've lost this. Uh, the church has become, in many cases, a, a, an institution, period, uh, in and uh, in, in of itself. But I think uh, there's always a remnant, and, uh, and I think uh, th this happens constantly in the life of the church. And, and we're seeing maybe an a acceleration of, of that kind of constant uh, death and renewal that's taking place uh, right now. I don't know, but uh, I don't worry too much about the institutional church. I think as, as a guy uh, who, who happens to be a Christian and involved in a church, you know, you go out and, and, uh, and you do your thing and that's it. What you feel called to do and if you, if you spend all of your time, you know, analyzing the institutional church, it's kind of fun, you know, to to examine your intestines and you can get all hung up in that too but uh, you forget about that and, and you go out and, and uh, you be what you think the church ought to be and uh, you know I'm not going to reform the church I think you can become so you know paralyzed with this whole business that you become totally inactive and I think you go about your work and, and I, I see pockets and communities of people uh, in the church that I think are, are really being the church I think uh, this is exciting, and and, uh, and I see more of these people than I do the, the images that you mentioned, and, and I'm not discouraged. I think it's a very encouraging thing to see, uh, for the first time, people you know, talking very honestly about the, the institutional church. We used to talk this way, but always in secret. Now it's in the open, and I think that's healthy. But I, I think the question comes down to what whether the church is an organization, an institution, or a movement. You read Eric Hoffer's book, The True Believer, and I don't know if you agree with Eric Hoffer, but I think he at least defines a movement fairly well. And I think he defines Christianity as a movement that was, with emphasis on past tense. Now, without, within Christianity, there have been su certain people, such as uh, Augustine, or Francis of uh, Assisi, or Francis Exa Xavier, or Ignatius Loyola, or Martin Luther, or John Calvin, or other people, who have taken this movement, the basic rudiments of the movement, and have gone off on another tangent and have done something something with it. And if that same thing can be done today, then I'll, I'll agree that the institutional church has something to offer. But then I would guess that you're going to end up with something which looks completely different from the institutional church. So what I'm saying is that if the church is going to serve people, it's got to be a movement. I still don't see that type of thing happening. And that's why I myself am very pessimistic about it. Until the church really dies, until people are really frustrated with the fact that they don't have something more than just the material things that we've got, and I think we need more than that. Until they get to that point, they aren't going to start a groundswell which is going to produce a movement. And I see as long as we've got clergymen with good salaries, as long as we've got the people who are supporting the, uh, supporting the clergymen having enough to eat, you're not going to have a good solid movement within Christianity. As uh, Pastor Evans just mentioned that uh his uh, line of response that he wasn't really too concerned about the institutionalized church and yet at the same breath he says he's going to stay in there and fight out how can you fight something that you uh, have already according to you what you just said given up hope on and also he mentioned that uh, uh, everyone has to lay his life on the line i think every individual of these three that i mentioned have and they have run the risk I think uh, of being excommunicated, of being tried for heresy, and uh, if we are not too familiar with the three men, I think closer to home we have uh, the Reverend William Youngdahl, who despite all the uh, cover-ups was driven out of town because of his uh, progressive stand on racism. Uh, Bob, why don't you tell us something more about your particular congregation and especially the way in which the, uh, we say the American Lutheran Church receives you? How do they look upon you when you're with her? <laughs> I can't speak for the American Lutheran Church. I think my relationship is, is with people in the public housing area 
in the north side of Minneapolis. When I say I don't, you know, care about the institutional church, I, mean, I don't have time to to get concerned about, uh, you know, institutions and hierarchy and anything like that. I feel feel I have a calling to serve people, and I I get involved there. I just don't have the time and, and, and the energy. I think there are people in the church who have more influence than I do to do that. But I, my thing is, is, is working in an area uh, of poverty and in a racially mixed area in a congregation. And, and, uh, and I've come close, I suppose, at times to being chopped down. And, uh, and I know uh, some of the, the pressures and, and the lack of funds and all that uh, that, uh, that have happened. We're in a church where the where the Roman Catholic Church checked out and and, uh, and, and we took over and, and uh, recognized that, that we're there, called not to success but to faithfulness in a church that I think, and in a society. I think here we have to say, if we have a sick church, we also have a sick society. But you know, you don't check out a society today because it's sick, but uh, uh, you can't jump out of your skin. You can out of the church. but. Uh, I think there's a similarity here too that uh, you, you hang with it because you're a part of it. And uh, is your congregation self-sustaining? No, Annette? no. Do you get money from the home mission department of the ALC? Right. And and this is all subject to you know uh, pulling the rug out from under your feet. And I think. Uh, uh, do they try to tell you what to do? <laughs> <laughs> Well, in a way. <laughs> but this doesn't bother me. I could fight them, but I think there's some more, there's some very real challenges in, in the community that, uh, that our church has nothing to do with it. Well, in the apparently, though, the church headquarters uh, supports you rather than opposing you, right? Otherwise, well, they wouldn't give you this money. Yeah, they do financially. But I, I've been in a meeting the last two uh, two days in which uh, our urban men are coming together and are, in a sense, ready to, to blow it wide open if they can, in terms of, of the whole urban ministry of the church. And uh, What do you mean, blow it open? Well, the, the policy, the attitudes, the investments of the church, uh, uh, many, many things in which I, I feel, uh, you know, they're, they're just not being realistic in relationship, uh, you know, to life in America today. I, I would rather see this a dialogue within the group, or this is getting to be a duet rather than a, than a, a discussion, unless you want to pursue it. Uh, I, I could change the subject a little bit with a, with a question to uh, Reverend Williams. Uh, Malcolm X used to say that at the same time that he um, gained his respect for himself as a black man, he left the white man's religion behind. And he was referring to his conversion to uh, Elijah Muhammad's uh, black Muslim religion. The question is raised sometimes, has uh, black Christianity really uh, sold out to the white man? Is it a kind of a Uncle Tom institution, therefore uh, unable to really provide the black man the kind of self-respect and so on that he needs? I must say that the majority of the books that the uh, black churches have, uh, the white man was the author of the book. Uh, one of the things that I've always said that you can cannot destroy it, is that little part of Christ, that soul, that within a spirit. Uh, often I've said you can destroy all Bibles, but there are men can uh, teach Jesus and crucify those that so believe that. Uh, I believe in uh, supreme, I believe in the hereafter, but I must say although it breaks my heart to say it, but I must say it, we cannot be serving the same God and have this much confusion. Uh, if it is, then it's taught different in the book because I'm sure 75% uh, of the people are good so-called to be Christians. Uh, Christians was taught to love one another. So uh, 
somewhere down the line, somebody else slipped and fell or something. I don't know. But uh, there's one thing about it that the little part of God that's in me that I believe in, uh, it cultivates me. It gives me strength and a determination all the way. It takes my life. Uh, you know, you can be uh, alive and yet dead. You're just a walking around body. And when really Christians get where they don't stand up for justice, whether they be black or white, they're dead. Uh, I kind of believe that the church pattern, the church system, because uh, the churches have not stood up for justice and for rights. The clergymen have been bought out or bribed out or scared out to stand up and speak out uh, made a lot of people turn from the church. Uh, even me, a little bit of church, uh, and get and try hard to help poor people. The people that they so-called call the uh, unreachable. I don't believe in unreachable. Uh, we all have problems. Uh, I was thinking what he just said. He had pulled away from the church. I think uh, his effort, the job that he is trying to do, is really done more than the church because he is trying to help people who need help. And this is what I like to see the church stand. So I call him Rebel. <laughs> the way church. <laughs> Clowns are backslapping. <laughs> I know Reverend Williams, and he does an awful lot with the people from the way. He and Syl Davis are very good friends, and Syl takes an awful lot of stock in what Reverend Williams says. By the time Malcolm X was uh, just about killed, he had also pulled away from the Muslim religion for lots of reasons, which he alludes to in his book, uh, in his autobiography from the black Muslim religion. Um, I think Reverend Williams is an example of a man who is a follower of Christ, as he himself keeps referring to, and yet would not fall into the generalization which we call Christianity. I would put him in, in you know, he follows Christ like he follows Gandhi, uh, like he follows all sorts of other people who have had strong convictions about human beings and about God in people. And so in this sense, knowing Reverend Williams and the type of work he does, and he does stand pretty much alone, in these towns. Uh, the question that you directed to him, I would say, fits him and yet it doesn't fit him because I think he's a very unique black clergyman in these towns. In, in your opting out of the church, maybe this is too broad a question. I'm directing this to Ron Welch. In, in your opting out of the church, and maybe this is too broad a question, but what Christology have you retained, or uh, could you wrap up your theology <laughs> in just a, in a, a few short statements? I'm interested to see if you know what you're retaining in in this religion that you referred to as your individual religion. Christ was a radical revolutionary who understood group dynamics and politics as well as, if not better, than Mahatma Gandhi and Castro and Lenin and Stalin and lots of other people. Now, I don't say that he, that he was working for the same things necessarily that Stalin or some of these guys are working for. But Christ was basically a revolutionary. Christ basically started a movement. And so when I talk about what I've retained from, in my Christology, I say that Jesus Christ talked about the beauty of creation. Jesus Christ was God incarnate. Now, I, we could talk for the next 20 years about what that means. But I like to think that Jesus Christ was a person who demonstrated by his own being what it meant to be beautiful what it meant to be a human being who wasn't afraid to look at life and live it. And I like to think this is pretty much what I think of in terms of God, what I think of in terms of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're going to, if you want to ask me, do I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yeah, so am I. I don't know what he is more than I am. I don't worry about it. When it comes down to the sacraments and everything else, you know, you want to get into the Eucharist, I say, wait a second, the Eucharist, the in baptism, these are all group dynamic methods that you've got to have in every good movement. How about the doctrine of salvation? The doctrine of salvation? I don't worry about it. How come? How come? I don't know. I just don't worry about it. I, I worry about living. I'm terribly existential, I suppose. If there's a hereafter, I'm not the least bit worried. I'm, I'm doing my best. I think, I think uh, the uh, Bishop James Pike has more or less answered uh, his question about what about salvation. I think he was uh, preaching a kind of heaven and earth. And for this very belief, 
that he thinks is right. He was threatened with a trial by the church bureaucracy. And that is why I brought the question, if it, at all a person can lay down his life for his belief, can he successfully and realistically do it within the church confines? <coughs> Recent examples are very discouraging, I have to say. Uh, you must bear in your mind that uh, if we we speaking of Christians, uh, but if we are really speaking of Christ followers, then we must be willing to die for what we believe. Uh, I think every Christian must be willing to stand up for justice. Now, that if it takes their life, then so what? You're better off there. We talk about heaven. We ain't can't go with our bodies, we must die anyway. So it's no harm to die for what's right. I think this is a blessing to be able to die for a good call. And all Christians should be willing to die for right, but make sure they're right. It's no disgrace in dying for what you believe in. I don't think so. Uh, the doctor that I preach, I'm willing to die for it. I'd rather be dead anyway. It can't be no worse than him. Even if there's no hair after, it can't be no worse than him. So I would rather be dead. I won't have the problems that lie with me. Problems every day. My head is beginning to turn white from problems, from injustice, from bruises, from being scorned, missing meals. So I'm willing to die for what's right, what I believe in. I believe in Christ, I believe in being a follower of Jesus Christ, and if someone shoots me down, good. I ain't, I ain't willing, so willing to die, Reverend. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I agree with what you're saying. Let's come back to the salvation thing, which you bring up and which you bring up. You read Franz Fanon's book on the wretched of the earth, or you read C. Wright Mills, or you read anybody who tries to analyze, again, the dynamics of religion. You'll always notice that religion or any good movement will always have something out here to shoot for, which is almost unattainable. Now, what Christianity did after Jesus Christ, and I don't think Jesus Christ did this because he worked with the lepers, and he worked with the prostitutes, and he worked with the pimps, and he worked with all the people in the streets and tried to alleviate their sufferings now. But what Christianity did when it sold out in 313 was it said, well, you'll get in the hereafter, suffer now. And I think this is what Pike was attacking, and I think this is what a lot of the people today are trying to attack. And, and I don't think Pike denies the possibility of a hereafter. I want to believe in a hereafter. Whether or not it's there, I don't know. But I think what we've got to get down to is to tear this whole business of Christianity, the salvation pill, or whatever you want to call it, and get rid of that, and start working out what does it mean to live according to the tenets of Jesus Christ, or God need any of these people now. Then you've got the real notion of salvation. Then you're saved. As Reverend Williams says, then you're alive. If you don't have that, you're dead anyhow. You'd be better off physically dead. If you don't have that gleam in your eye, you don't have something to live for now. I, I, I think we're talking here about a road with two ditches on the side that are pretty close together. Uh, I think we, we've been hearing a, a ethical that, that uh, Christianity is ethics. I think ethics are involved in Christianity. They've been left out. Uh, a kind of humanitarianism which uh, I can't be a part of because I don't have the ability. I'm just not the kind of guy that can, of in my own accord, find uh, the kind of strength and power that I feel necessary. I find this in, in, in Christianity. If that's my crutch or my bag, you, know, you accept me like that, and just as I accept someone else in their position. But I, you know, I come back to a, to a doctrine of the word, which I think the Roman Catholic Church is, is finally coming back to, and uh, I, I take my cue not from, from an intellectual kind of uh, interpretation that I have of society. I think as a church, we've been in a ditch on the other side of the road, where we've, we've uh, as a black church, which really was, in a sense, the tool of the white uh, uh, colonial, colonial people, you know, this is how you kept the black people in line. Uh, 
organization was the black church and, and a white man kept him there and talking about pie in the sky and uh, I can't buy this either and somewhere uh, there's a kind of tension uh, between the two I think as a church we've been in, in, in a ditch on, on both sides of the road but I think we've gone through a, a shifting of emphasis from from the time way back when you know it was a relationship between God and the Father and nature some of the old colleagues of the church most of them you know the horns of the unicorn protect me from you know all the, the storm and stress and the dangers of nature and I think we shifted to a, a, a Jesus Christ soul relationship and the whole thing in life which ultimately to me is extremely selfish if that's your only concern about you know my salvation it's a part of it but it's not all of it and uh, I think we were hung up there for a long time important as it is to the ne neglect maybe of the third area which I think we find ourselves in right now or, or coming into hopefully that is a relationship between the Holy Spirit and society. But our concern is not, you know, primarily for myself. I think, you know, that the, my book Christ has taken care of, uh, of that. I don't have to worry about that. But uh, I'm led by the Spirit now to, to, to serve the needs of people. And, uh, and this to me is not a humanitarian ethical position only, but uh, it's a total uh, relationship that I see. and. Uh, and this is where I find myself, and I'm comfortable there, and uh, I don't say this is where you have to be. But I think with a relationship to the Word and, and, uh, and the Spirit at this point, because I can't make it by myself, and I don't think society can. I think the whole humanitarian bit, of, you know, we don't have the time, we don't have the ability, because we're, I think, pretty selfishly orientated. And to, you know, pull ourselves, you know, out of that bay, I don't think we can. And uh, this is where I sit. Um, Mr. Welsh, um, after what uh, Reverend Evans said about the strength that we seem to not get on our own accord, but that some realize that they can only get through Christianity uh, you've gone to seminary and been five years as a Catholic priest. Obviously some changes must have taken place yeah. in you. <laughs> uh, what I'm wondering is, uh, did this happen while you were a priest, or did it happen all of a sudden and uh, would caused you to leave the church, the established church? It's awfully hard to define or put right down where something took place. My father is the greatest priest I've ever met. I'm the last of ten children. I've got 47 nephews and nieces. And he knows how to make people happy. That was my basic notion of what it meant to be a priest. So I wanted to be like my father, only I thought that to be a clergyman, I could do this on a grander scale. Until I became a Catholic priest and realized the politics involved. And I realized that two years before I was ordained, when I was down street preaching in the South. Uh, this was back in the, about 1961 or 62, when the Freedom Riders began. And so there was, I went down there to preach Jesus Christ as a Catholic, and came back a Christian, or a follower of Jesus Christ, and a much different version than I went down there. When I was living as a Catholic priest, I was sliced up and down one side and another by the hierarchy in town here. Uh, as Bob says, they have a right to stand what they stand for, I have a right to stand what I stand for. I stand for the type of priest my father is. I couldn't be that, personally speaking, and remain a Catholic priest without either becoming an insane person, and I mean that in the sixth sense of the word, or a person who would end up going out and, and killing because I thought something was doing that much harm, which I saw organized Christianity doing. And so it was a process, which began when I first thought about becoming a priest, but which climaxed when I saw the crystallization of the Catholic Church especially and saw that it wasn't about to break down and, and move, at least in my time, when I had good years to serve. I suppose uh, you ask this question often about uh, regard to comparison between yourself and Father Grappi in, in Milwaukee. Do, do you know him and could you tell us what his thinking is, uh, why has he decided to remain, remain within the institutional church? 
as I said before, if you've got a situation inside where you can be heard, and if you've got a power inside which can be used, you'd be a fool to move outside of it as long as you're working at the same basic things that we're working at. And Rabbi is not as much a Catholic priest as he is a national figure who happens to have a Roman collar. Now you may say that, that which comes first, the chicken or the egg? I don't know. But I'm saying for Grappi to pull out now, we would be losing somebody in the movement. And so I would want to see Grappi pull out. If it gets to the point where Grappi, personally speaking, can't take it as a Catholic priest, then I want Grappi to pull out, because I think too much of Grappi. Does this mean there's a difference in the, um, in the hierarchy, in the Milwaukee area, compared with, with here? Sure, they're scared. Our guys aren't scared yet. They don't even know we got a problem in Minneapolis. Time for one or two, one or two more questions. I'm not. This can be addressed to anyone on the panel, but I'm not exactly sure where, where my sentiments lie in regard to the institutional church. But I do think that an institution, in some cases, is a necessity. And perhaps, maybe to some degree, the, the church as an institution is a necessity, too. Now, we can attack the church all that we want to, but I would like to ask any, any of the members of the panel this. What basically is wrong inside the institutional church, which, which makes it, you know, such a big block to anything that can move? Is it fair to say that perhaps we have such poor leadership that this is why the church isn't moving at all? I'll go all day and let them start. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to say to try to answer that, that question. I could talk about it the rest of the day, but to try to answer that question, uh, the good Christians of the church uh, have failed to stand for what's right of just uh, I don't know somehow or another uh, we get too much involved in the beautiful building we get too much involved in uh, material things to remember that we all are God's children and I, I think when the church get where it refuses to answer to the call of the poor of the oppressed or to answer to the call of any injustice that being used or being done on any individual if the church refused to stand it's dead anyway so all you have to do as one individual is to encourage others when it doesn't have to be the black it could be the red the white or any unjust the church don't take no part they it don't concern me so the church is dead because don't nothing concern them but uh beautiful buildings and beautiful pews, well I like beautiful things, but you must be more concerned because the church is the, should be a service to the people and not to people serve the church. I think the church has always been dead and uh, in unrealistic ways I think we think of the church as institution. You know, institutions aren't alive, uh, buildings aren't alive, only people are alive and I think using the church as the body of Christ, I think scattered throughout the church, I think there are many, many people who are very much alive and very much concerned. Uh, I think there are those who are not. But I think the church tends, the institutional church, tends to take on the, the kind of climate that uh, you know we call Americanism or the American way of life, which says, you know, uh, uh, what really counts is that you produce. I, I see my status symbol as one who can produce you know, more bricks, more dollars, uh, and more people and I think we measure people and we measure programs uh, whether they're inside or outside of the church according to these kind of success stories and and I think we have to recognize that, that the worthiness of people is not the fact that you know they produce but rather that they exist and this is this is my worthiness and I don't think the church I think it uh, it understands this but it loses so easily uh, the whole concept and the commitment to people, uh, period. Uh, 
and we get hung up in, in a commitment to white people and nice people and successful people and good people and uh, and this is very comfortable and, and you end up you know manipulating people I, I think it's a matter of commitment uh, and, and you can't I think there are committed people in the church and there are many and they're they're in positions of leadership and yet uh, and somehow it's so easy to to get in the ditch where or we fall prey to the to the kind of uh, materialism that, that, that permeates our society. You see it in racism and uh, and everywhere. And uh, and I think it'll always be with it to curse it and to damn it is is uh, is to be unrealistic too. You call it uh, you know a spade a spade, and yet the renewal, uh, as Luther says, you know, don't forget that you know there are only sinners in the church. And uh, I take that pretty seriously because then I kind of fit. Before Castro could move to Cuba, he had to know the hills. Before he knew the hills, he had to know the people. Before he, and along with knowing the people, he had to also know his enemy. Castro listened well. The first good quality of any leader is his ability to listen and to perceive. And one of the problems that's happened with Christianity is that the leaders have isolated and insulated themselves, the people who run the churches. They've isolated and insulated themselves from the people who they are to serve. Remember the Last Supper where Christ said, Now, do you see what I've done? You no longer call me master. I am your servant. All right, if I am really your servant, that means I listen to you and I speak for you. If you can't get up here, if you can't uh, go talk to somebody up here, I speak for you, but that means I've listened to you. All right, I think we need institutionalized church meaning people coming together to form a, a body of power. All right, then if they have a spokesman, that spokesman hopefully is well attuned to those people. Then you've got a real church. That man is serving those people. Those leaders are serving those people. But see, it comes down to what these two men said. We got into the bricks and mortar thing. And we forgot that the church was people. We forgot the whole dynamic of a movement. And we got into the organizational uh, power crazy thing and forgot what it was all about. And that's why what I said before, it's got to be broken down so that you finally get down to what we call the grassroots levels. And then it will come again. We're getting an institutional church again, and I think it's beautiful. It's happening all over. The hippies are part of it, the, the true hippies. Uh, the black power people are part of it. Uh, the, the people in the Far East are part of it. The people in Cuba are part of it. It's happening. And I think that the last word is what's important. If you'll ever notice black people, they walk around and say, what's happening, brother? All right, that's when you ask people what's happening, then you've got some rea reality of church taking place because people are listening to people. Gwen Jones Davis, who was one of my bosses, can listen to at least three conversations at one time. She's a leader. She listens. Time has come for us to stop. We are all deeply indebted to you for being with us and um, before I give you a chance to express your appreciation with a round of applause I have these two announcements Dudley Riggs Brave New Workshop is going to present a one half hour specially written um, particularly for this day at Melby Hall at 4.30 it's in about half an hour I emphasize this is written by them by whether it's him or his group, especially for our day, so I would encourage you all to go. Then this evening, the session with Milt Williams will begin at 6.30, held in the College Center lobby. So again, thank you.